Okay, today is the uh, 13th of August, uh, and we are at uh, Sanghita Nikaya 35, chapter Salayatana Sanghita, uh, from the Sutta 35.132. On one occasion, the Venerable Mahakachana was dwelling among the people of Avanti in a forest hut at Makarakata. And a number of Brahmin youths, students of the Brahmin Rohicha, for collecting firewood, approached the Venerable Mahakachana's forest hut. Having approached, they stormed and trampled all around the hut, and in a boisterous and noisy manner, they played various pranks, saying, These shaveling ascetics, menials, swarthy offspring of the Lord's feet, are honored, respected, esteemed, worshipped, and venerated by their servile devotees. Stop here for a moment. These Brahmins, uh, because they, they uh, the priests sect, uh, so they look down on Samanas. Uh, samanas are uh, the, uh, the renunciants of other castes. Uh, these Brahmins, uh, they, they, they are one caste, uh, and all the other castes, uh, they renounce and become monks or ascetics, uh, they are called samanas. Uh. So these Brahmins believe uh, that the Brahmins are born from the head of uh, a Brahma god, uh, whereas uh, the other castes uh, are born from the feet uh, of Brahma. So now they know uh, that these uh, Buddha's disciples uh, are respected. Uh, and venerated by their devotees, so they are jealous and they don't like it. And they came outside the kuti and made a lot of noise. And the venerable Mahakachana came out of his dwelling and said to those Brahmin youths, Don't make any noise, boys. I will speak to you on the Dhamma. When this was said, those youths became silent. Then the venerable Mahakachana addressed those youths with verses. Those men of old who excelled in virtue, those Brahmins who recall the ancient rules, the sense doors guarded, well protected, dwelt having vanquished wrath within. They took delight in Dhamma and meditation, those Brahmins who recall the ancient rules. But these have fallen, claiming we recite, puffed up by clan, bearing unrighteously, Overcome by anger, armed with diverse weapons, they molest both the frail and the firm. For one with sense doors unguarded, all the vows he undertakes are vain, just like the wealth a man gains in a dream. Fasting and sleeping on the ground, bathing at dawn, study of the three Vedas, rough heights, metal locks and dirt, hymns, rules and vows, austerities, hypocrisy, bent staffs, ablutions. These emblems of the Brahmins are used to increase their worldly gains. A mind that is well concentrated, clear and free from blemish, tender towards all sentient beings. That is the path for attaining Brahma. I'll stop here for a moment. So here, the Prabhu Mahakachana was annoyed by these uh, Brahmin youths. So to tell him off, uh, he said, uh, those ancient Brahmins, uh, they really practiced the Dhamma and meditated. Uh. But nowadays, uh, Brahmins are not like before. Uh, they bully others, and then their sense doors are unguarded, and then they do their rituals like fasting and sleeping on the ground, bathing at dawn, study the three Vedas, their books, uh, wearing rough hides and matted locks and dirt uh, when they do their sacrifices to heaven uh, and chanting their hymns and practicing their rules and vows and austerities and uh, all that is hypocrisy, he says. Uh, uh, all used to increase their worldly gains. Uh, uh, so that will naturally make them angry. Uh. Then those Brahmin youths, angry and displeased, approached the Brahmin Lohicha and told him, 
So that should be Brahmana, Lohichala, the holy man, Brahmana. See now, sir, you should know that the ascetic Mahakachana categorically denigrates and scorns the hymns of the Brahmins. And this was said, oh sorry, they went back to their teacher, the Brahmin Lohicha, and complained to the Brahmin Lohicha that this um, Mahakachana said my past disparaging remarks about Brahmins. When this was said, the Brahmin Lohicha was angry and displeased. But then it occurred to him, it is not proper for me to abuse and revile the ascetic Mahakachana solely on the basis of what I have heard from these youths. Let me approach him and inquire. Then the Brahmin Lohicha, together with those Brahmin youths, approached the verbal Mahakachana. He exchanged greetings with the verbal Mahakachana, and when they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, he sat down to one side and said, Master Kachana, did a number of Brahmin youths, my students, come this way while collecting firewood? They did, Brahmin. Did Master Kachana have any conversation with them? I did have a conversation with them, Brahmin. What kind of conversation did you have with them, Master Kachana? The conversation I had with those youths was like this. Those men of old who excelled in virtue, those Brahmins who recall the ancient rules, their sense doors guarded, well, well protected, dwelt having vanquished wrath within. They took delight in Dhamma and meditation, etc., etc., as before. Such was the conversation I had with those youths. And Lohicha asked, Maha, Master Kachana, you said now with sense doors unguarded. In what way, Master Kachana, is one with sense doors unguarded? And the Venerable Mahakachana said, Here, Brahmin, having seen a form with the eye, someone is intent upon a pleasing form and repelled by a displeasing form. He dwells without having set up mindfulness of the body with a limited mind. And he does not understand, as it really is, that liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, wherein those evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. Similarly, having heard a sound, having smelled an odor, having tasted a taste, uh, and recognized a touch and thoughts, uh, someone is intent upon pleasing contact, uh, and repelled by a displeasing contact. It dwells without having set up mindfulness of the body with a limited mind, and he does not understand as it really is that liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, wherein those even, evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. It is in such a way, Brahmin, that one is with sense doors unguarded, and the Brahmin said, It is wonderful, Master Kachana. It is amazing, Master Kachana. How Master Kachana has declared one whose sense doors are actually unguarded to be one with sense doors unguarded. But Master Kachana said, With sense doors guarded. In what way, Master Kachana, is one with sense doors guarded? Here, Brahmin, having seen a form with the eye, someone is not intent upon a pleasing form and not repelled by a displeasing form. He dwells, having set up mindfulness of the body, with a measureless mind, and he understands, as it really is, that liberation by mind, liberation by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. Similarly, for sounds, smells, taste, touch, and thoughts. It is in such a way, Brahmin, that one is with sense doors guarded, it is wonderful, Master Kachana. It is amazing, Master Kachana. How Master Kachana has declared one whose sense doors are actually guarded to be one with sense doors guarded. Magnificent Master Gautama, uh, Master Kachana. Magnificent Master Kachana. The Dhamma has been made clear in many ways by Master Kachana. From today, let Master Kachana remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. Let Master Kachana approach the Lohicha family just as he approaches the families of the lay followers in Makara Kata. The Brahmin youths and maidens there will pay homage to Master Kachana. They will stand up for him out of respect. 
they will offer him a seat and water and that will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. It's the end of the sutta. So here, this uh, Brahmin, uh, he was a bit annoyed uh, that the uh, Venerable Mahakachana had uh, spoken ill uh, of Brahmins. Uh, but he came to find out actually whether this was what he said. Uh, then uh, Rebbe Mahakachana was not shy uh, to tell him exactly what he said. Uh, and he asked him about what he mean by sense doors unguarded and sense doors guarded. And when he, when he heard the explanation, uh, then he, he realized uh, that uh, this is a practicing monk, uh, really practices this, uh, so he had a lot of respect. But unlike uh, the Buddha's followers uh, who take refuge uh, with the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha, you find here, I think, uh, does he take refuge with this triple gem only with the Burma uh, Oh yeah, I took refuge with the, with the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha and then uh, also with the... So generally, uh, you find during the Buddha's days uh, that the Brahmins, uh, they were a bit jealous uh, of the Buddha and his disciples. Uh, not only the Brahmins, uh, other ascetics also. Because the Buddha and his disciples, they were very well respected and well supported. So the others were not so well supported and respected, so they became jealous. The next sutta is 35.133. On one occasion, the Venerable Udai was living at Kamanda in the Brahmin Todeus Mango Grove. Then a Brahmin youth, a student of the Brahmin lady of the Vera, Vera Hachani clan, approached the Venerable Udai and greeted him. When they had concluded the greetings and cordial talk, he sat down to one side, and the Venerable Udai instructed, exhorted, inspired, and gladdened him with the Dharma talk. Having been instructed, exhorted, inspired, and gladdened by the Dharma talk, the Brahmin youth rose from his seat, approached the Brahmin lady of the Vera Hachani clan, and said to her, See now, madam, you should know that the ascetic Udai teaches a Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. With the right meaning and phrasing, he reveals a holy life that is com perfectly complete and pure. I stop there for a moment. Uh, so you see here, in the suttas, uh, we find uh, that the holy life uh, explained by the Buddha and the Buddha's Arahant disciples uh, is perfectly complete and pure. So the Buddha's teachings are complete and pure. So there is no need uh, to add to the Buddha's teachings. Uh. A lot of later monks, uh, they have added a lot of new books uh, to the Buddha's teachings, uh, which are not necessary, uh, because by adding the new books, uh, they have distorted the Buddha's teachings. And then the lady said, In that case, young man, invite the ascetic Udai in my name for tomorrow's meal. Yes, madam, the youth replied. Then he went to the Venerable Udai and said to him, Let Master Udai consent to accept tomorrow's meal from our revered teacher, the Brahmin lady of the Vera Hachani clan. The Venerable Udai consented by silence. Then when the night had passed, in the morning, the Venerable Udai dressed, took his bowl and outer robe, and went to the residence of the Brahmin lady of the Vera Hachani clan. There he sat down in the appointed seat, then with her own hands, the Brahmin lady served and satisfied the Venerable Udai with various kinds of delicious food. When the Venerable Udai had finished eating and, and had put away his bowl, the Brahmin lady put on her sandals, sat on a high seat, covered her head and told him, Preach the Dhamma ascetic. Having said there will be an occasion for that, Sister, he rose from his seat and departed. So here this lady uh, asked the Venerable Udai to give a Dhamma talk. Uh, but Venerable Udai said uh, uh, on a later occasion uh, and departed. Uh. Why did he depart? Uh, because the lady didn't show enough respect uh, by using her sandals and sitting on a high seat and covering her head. Uh. The second time that Brahmin youth approached the Venerable Udai, 
and uh, receive uh, uh, Dhamma teaching uh, and he was very respectful uh, and then he came and told the lady again See now madam, you should know that the ascetic who die teaches a Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end. With the right meaning and phrasing, he reveals a holy life that is perfectly complete and pure. And she said, in such a way, young man, you keep on praising the ascetic who die. But then I told him, preach the Dhamma ascetic. He said, there will be an occasion for that sister. And he rose from his seat and departed. And the youth said, that madam was because you put on your sandals, sat down on a high seat, covered your head and told him, preach the Dhamma ascetic. For these worthies respect and revere the Dhamma. And then she said, in that, so... Stop it for a moment. Huh? So here the, the youth, huh, the young man told her, his teacher huh, that uh, you didn't show enough respect. Huh? You were wearing your sandals and you sat on the highest seat and covered your head. Huh? Uh, and these parables, huh, they respect the Dhamma uh, they, because the Dhamma is so worthy of uh, respect and that uh, if somebody behaves like this and uh, does not show enough respect for the Dhamma, the monk will not teach me. And then she said, in that case, young man, invite the ascetic who die in my name for tomorrow's meal. Yes, madam, he replied. Then he went to the venerable Udai and invited him. Uh, and the venerable Udai consented by silence. Uh, and similarly, the same thing happened. Uh, he came and had his meal, the lady served him and all that. When the member Udai had finished eating and had put away his bowl, the Brahmin lady removed her sandals, sat down on a low seat, and covered her head, and said to him, Venerable sir, what do the Arahans maintain must exist for there to be pleasure? And what is it that the Arahans maintain must cease to exist for there to be no pleasure and pain? And the member said, Sister, the Arahans maintain that when the eye exists, there is pleasure and pain. And when the eye does not exist, there is no pleasure and pain. The Arahans maintain that when the, when the ear exists, there is pleasure and pain. And when the ear does not exist, there is no pleasure and pain. Similarly, for the nose, tongue, body and mind. When this was said, the Brahmin lady of the Vera Hachani clan said to the Venerable Udai, Magnificent Venerable Sir, Magnificent Venerable Sir, the Dhamma has been made clear in many ways by Venerable Udai, as though he were turning upright what had been turned upside down, revealing, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go for refuge to the Blessed One, to the Dhamma and to the Bhikkhu Sangha. From today, that Master Udai remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. That's the end of the Sutta. So when she, in this, the second time, she invited this Venerable Udai, yeah? uh, after the meal, she knew what to do. Nah? She took off her sandals and covered her head sat on a low seat and then asked this question and then the verbal Udai explained for there to be pleasure and pain there must be the six sense organs when you have the six sense organs then you have contact when you have contact then the feeling arises so the feeling can be pleasant or painful so similarly for all the other sense bases so if there's no six sense doors, uh, there's no contact, so there's no pleasure and pain, uh, no feeling. Uh. So she was impressed by this uh, and she took refuge in the Triple Gem and also uh, the follower of the Venerable Udai. In the Sutta 35.135, the Buddha said, Monks, it is a gain for you, it is well gained by you that you have obtained the opportunity for living the holy life. I have seen monks, the hell named contacts sixfold base. There, whatever form one sees with the eye is undesirable, never desirable, unlovely, never lovely, disagreeable, never agreeable. Similarly, whatever sounds one hears with the ear, 
whatever odor one smells, whatever taste one savors, whatever touch one feels, whatever thoughts one cognizes uh, is undesirable, never desirable, unlovely, never lovely, disagreeable, never agreeable. It is a gain for you, monks. I stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying uh, that uh, a monk who practices the holy life uh, is very good, uh, is benef- very beneficial uh, because the Buddha says uh, he has seen the hell uh, where all the sixfold contacts uh, are painful. Uh, whatever you see is frightening, painful. Whatever sounds you hear are so frightening. Uh, painful, whatever uh, smells, etc. Uh, even the mind, uh, on top of the physical suffering, uh, even the mental torture, these beings in hell experience. Uh, mm. So, because of that, the Buddha says, uh, if we live the holy life, uh, that is really good. Uh, because we are moving away from the direction of hell. Uh, you don't live the holy life, eh? uh, and you don't attain, especially if you don't attain the stream entry and eh? become an Arya, uh, the chances are that you, you still go down to hell. And the Buddha continued, It is a gain for you monks, it is well gained by you, that you have obtained the opportunity for living the holy life. I have seen monks, the heaven named contact sixfold base. There, whatever form one sees with the eye is desirable. Never undesirable, lovely, never unlovely, agreeable, never disagreeable. Similarly, whatever sound one hears, whatever odor, taste, touch, and thoughts uh, one cognizes, uh, is desirable, never undesirable, lovely, never unlovely, agreeable, never disagreeable. It's a gain for you, monks. It is well gained by you that you have obtained the opportunity for living the holy life. So the second part, the Buddha says, uh, he has seen the heavens uh, where if you are in that heaven, uh, all your six sense bases, uh, all the contacts uh, are lovely, uh, desirable, uh, agreeable. Uh. Uh, in other words, uh, you will be very, very happy there. So the Buddha is hinting uh, that if you practice the holy life sincerely, uh, uh, you will be able to attain a rebirth in that heaven where you enjoy life for a long time. So this is just an incentive. It's an Indian belief that if you if you become a monk, practice the holy life, that heaven is assured for you. 35.12 The Buddha said, Monks, devas and humans delight in forms, take delight in forms, rejoice in forms. With the change, fading away and cessation of forms, devas and humans dwell in suffering. Devas and humans delight in sounds, delight in odors, in taste, in touch, in thoughts. With the change, fading away and cessation of these uh, sense objects, eh? Devas and humans dwell in suffering. Pray for a moment. So, heavenly beings and humans, we enjoy life through the six senses, sensual pleasures, in terms of forms, sounds, smells, taste, touch, and thoughts. But because these Sense objects uh, are impermanent, uh, they will change uh, and fade away, uh, cease. Uh, so when this change happens, uh, then uh, we will suffer. Uh, but monks, the Tathagata, the Arhan, Samasambuddha, is understood as they really are, the origin and passing away, the gratification, danger and the escape. In the case of forms, he does not take delight in forms. Does not take del- does not take delight in forms. Does not rejoice in forms. With the change, fading away, and cessation of forms, the Tathagata dwells happily. 
is understood as they really are. The origin and passing away, gratification, danger and escape. In the case also of sounds, odors, tastes, touch, thoughts. It does not delight in the six sense objects does not take delight in the six sense objects, does not rejoice in the six sense objects. With the change fading away and cessation of the six sense objects, the Tathagata dwells happily. That is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the fortunate one, the teacher, further said, forms, sounds, odors, tastes, touch and thoughts, huh? desirable, lovely, agreeable, so long as it said they are, they are. These are considered happiness by the world with its devas. But when these cease, that they consider suffering. The noble ones have seen as happiness the seizing of identity. This view of those who clearly see runs counter to the entire world. What others speak of as happiness, that the noble ones say is suffering. What others speak of as suffering, that the noble ones know as bliss. Behold this Dhamma hard to comprehend. Here the foolish are bewildered. For those with blocked minds it is obscure. Sheer darkness for those who do not see. But for the good it is disclosed. Dislike here for those who see. The Dalits are skilled in the Dhamma. Don't understand it in its presence. This Dhamma isn't easily understood by those afflicted with lust for existence, who flow along the stream of existence, deeply mired in Mara's realm. Who else apart from the Noble Ones are able to understand this state? When they have rightly known that state, the taintless ones are fully quenched. So, the Noble Disciples, uh, Aryans, uh, they do not take delight in the sense of text, uh, worldly happiness. Uh, so when they change, uh, because uh, the Sixth Sense of text, uh, Okay, everything in the world must change. Yeah? So when there's change, yeah? we don't suffer. So what do we take happiness in? We take happiness uh, in our mind. Yeah? We look for happiness uh, within, yeah? and that happiness will not change. Yeah? If we depend on outside things, uh, outside things will change. Yeah? So the Buddha also says yeah, that uh, this Dhamma is very hard to comprehend. Yeah? Foolish people uh, are bewildered, cannot understand at all, sheer darkness for them. But for the most people who wisdom can understand. Those people who practice the Dhamma, we are very different from worldly people. Worldly people like to laugh and joke and all that. Uh, people who are spiritually mature. Uh, they are very serious. They don't laugh and joke uh, like uh, worldly people. And worldly people like to talk a lot. Uh, find somebody always uh, to talk and joke. Uh, but people who understand the Dhamma know uh, that this world is suffering. So they are more serious. Uh, they don't look for somebody to talk and joke. Uh, and time is so precious. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that uh, time is very precious. Uh, and goes by very fast. We waste your time uh, very soon. Uh, and you find I don't have time left. Uh. 35.146 uh, Buddha said, uh, Monks, I will teach you new and old karma, the cessation of karma, and the way leading to the cessation of karma. Listen to that and attend closely. I will speak. And what monks is old karma? The I is old karma to be seen as generated and fashioned by volition, as something to be felt. The ear, nose, tongue, body and mind is all karma. To be seen as generated and fashioned by volition, as something to be felt. This is called old karma. And what amounts is new karma. Whatever action one does now by body, speech or mind, this is called new karma. And what amounts is the cessation of karma. When one lip reaches liberation through the cessation of bodily action, verbal action and mental action. This is called the cessation of karma. And what monks is the way leading to the cessation of karma? 
is this noble eightfold path that is right view, right in right thoughts, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right recollection, right concentration. Thus monks, I have taught old karma, I have taught new karma, I have taught the cessation of karma, I have taught the way leading to the cessation of karma. Whatever should be done, monks, by a compassionate teacher, out of compassion for his disciples, desiring their welfare, that I have done for you. These are the feet of trees, monks. These are empty huts. Meditate, monks. Do not be negligent, lest you regret it later. This is our instruction to you. It's the end of the sutta. So here the Buddha says, eh? our eye, our ear, nose, tongue, body and mind. This old karma created by old karma. Volition is karma. Uh, a new karma is what we are doing now. Uh, our intentional actions now uh, to the body, speech and mind uh, is a new karma. And karma ceases uh, when one becomes liberated. When one becomes liberated, there is no uh, self, uh, no ego. Uh, so one does not uh, do any more karma. Even though one does action, it does not count as karma because there is no ego behind that action. And the way leading to the cessation of karma is a noble eightfold path. When you practice a noble eightfold path, then you become liberated from the ego, from the self. And whatever you do also is not counted as karma. 35.151 Buddha said, Monks, this holy life is lived without students and without a teacher. A monk who has students and a teacher dwells in suffering, not in comfort. A monk who has no students and no teacher dwells happily in comfort. And how, monks, does a monk who has students and a teacher dwell in suffering, not in comfort? Here, monks, when a monk has seen a form with the eye, there arise in him evil and wholesome states. Memories and intentions connected with the factors, they dwell within him. Since those evil and wholesome states dwell within him, he is called one who has students. They assail him. Since evil and wholesome states assail him, he is called one who has a teacher. Similarly, when a monk has heard a sound, smelled an uh, odor, tasted a taste, uh, recognized a touch, recognized a thought, uh, and uh, there arise in him uh, evil and wholesome states, uh, memories and intentions connected with the factors, uh, and these unwholesome states dwell within him. Uh, since those evil and wholesome states dwell within him, he is called one who has students. They assail him. Since evil and wholesome states assail him, he is called one who has a teacher. Let's stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, ordinary. Uh, a learned uh, person, a uh, worldly, worldling, uh, he, when uh, the six senses uh, are contacted uh, by sense objects, uh, uh, evil and wholesome states arise. Uh. So when evil and wholesome states arise uh, and dwell within him, uh, those, because the unwholesome states dwell within him, uh, they are called his students. Uh. But at the same time, because they assail him, meaning uh, they they attack him. They what do you say? They they give him uh, a lot of dukkha. Uh, they are called a teacher. In fact, dukkha is our teacher. Dukkha is a very good teacher. Uh, if we go through life uh, in an unskillful way, then we will have a lot of dukkha. Yeah, this dukkha arises because uh, whatever uh, comes in contact with us uh, to our six sense doors, uh, we perceive it in the wrong way uh, because we don't perceive it in the right way. Uh, and then uh, they give us uh, suffering. Uh. So when they give us suffering, uh, then we start thinking, uh, why, why, why am I suffering? Why am I suffering? And when you start asking questions uh, slowly, uh, you will get the answers. Uh. So because uh, dukkha teaches us, uh, uh, so dukkha. These evil and wholesome states that give us dukkha is called a teacher. And how monks does a monk who has no students and no teacher dwell happily in comfort? Here monks, when a monk has seen a form with the eye, 
that do not arise in him evil and wholesome states, memories and intentions connected with the fetters, they do not dwell within him. Since those evil and wholesome states do not dwell within him, he is called one who has no students, they do not assail him. Since evil and wholesome states do not assail him, he is called one who has no teacher. Further, when a monk has heard a sound with the ear, smelt a smell, tasted a taste, cognize a touch, cognize a thought, and uh, there do not arise in him evil and wholesome states, uh, they do not dwell within him, uh, then he is called one who has no students, uh, and since they do not dwell within him, uh, so they do not assail him, uh, do not attack him. So he is called one who has no teacher. It is in this way, monks, that a monk who has no students and no teacher dwells happily in comfort. Monks, the whole, this holy life is lived without students and without a teacher. A monk who has students and a teacher dwells in suffering, not in comfort. A monk who has no students and no teacher dwells happily in comfort. That's the end of the sutta. So these uh, unwholesome states that arise within us, uh, they can be considered students uh, and con we can be considered our teacher. So that's why sometimes in some students and uh, in some suttas, uh, the Buddha says, uh, a monk goes to dwell alone uh, in a cave or up in a forest, in a hill and all that. Uh, but if he brings along uh, this craving and all this uh, unwholesome state within, it, within him, uh, then he's not living alone, uh, he's living with a partner. Uh, next sutta is 35.152. Buddha said, uh, Monks, if wanderers of other sects ask you, for what purpose, friends, is the holy life lived under the ascetic Gautama, Samana Gautama? Being asked thus, you should answer those wanderers thus. It is, friends, for the full understanding of suffering, that the holy life is lived under the Blessed One. Then monks, if those wanderers ask you, what friends is that suffering for the full understanding of which the holy life is lived under the ascetic Gautama? Being asked thus, you should answer those wanderers thus. The I, friends, is suffering. It is for the full understanding of this that the holy life is lived under the Blessed One. Forms are suffering. It is for the full understanding of them that the holy life is lived under the Blessed One. Similarly, I consciousness, I contact, whatever feeling that arises, uh, it is for the full understanding of all these uh, that the holy life is lived. Similarly, the ear, for the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body and the mind, uh, and for each of these sense, uh, organs, uh, then you have for each uh, the sense object, the sense consciousness, the contact and the feeling that arises. Uh, all that uh, gives suffering. Uh. So to understand suffering, uh, you have to understand all these uh, uh, sense bases. Uh. This, friends, is the suffering for the full understanding of which the holy life is lived under the Blessed One. Being asked as monks, you should answer those wonders of other sects in such a way. The end of the sutta. So here, the Buddha is saying uh, that uh, the purpose of the holy life is uh, to understand suffering, uh, where suffering comes from, and how suffering can cease, and the path uh, that will bring you to the cessation of suffering. Uh. So here, because this sutta is under the Sangyutta, dealing with the six sense bases, uh, the Buddha is saying uh, that suffering comes from the six sense bases. Uh. In the previous Kanda Sangyutta, where the chapter on the five aggregates, uh, the Buddha will explain the similar way in reference to the five aggregates. Uh. Holy life is lived for the understanding of suffering and where does suffering come from? Uh, from the body, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. Uh. So to understand suffering, you've got to understand the five aggregates, uh, and then you'll understand suffering. Uh, so here it's about the similar thing uh, with the six sense spaces. Uh. The next sutta, 
is 35.160 on page 1218. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha in Jivaka's mango grove. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, develop concentration. When a monk is concentrated, things become manifest to him as they really are. And what becomes manifest to him as they really are? The I becomes manifest to him as they really are, as impermanent. Forms become manifest to him as they really are, as impermanent. I consciousness, I contact, whatever feeling that arises becomes manifest to him as they really are, as impermanent. Similarly, the ear becomes manifest to him as, he re- as it really is, as impermanent. Uh, sounds become manifest to him as they really are, as impermanent. Ear consciousness, ear contact, the feeling that arises, uh, all become manifest to him as they really are, as impermanent. Uh. And similarly for the other sense bases, uh, develop concentration monks. When a monk is concentrated, things become manifest to him as they really are. So here the Buddha is saying uh, uh, concentration is very important. Uh that when you attain concentration, then things become manifest, becomes very clear, very clear as they really are. And what is it that we want to see very clearly? Here it says the eye, eye, eye consciousness, eye contact, eye that forms, then eye consciousness, eye contact, and the feeling. And similarly, similarly for the ear, for sounds, for ear consciousness, ear contact and feeling, and for all the other uh, sense pieces. Uh, you will remember uh, that we read a similar sutta under the Kanda, uh, Kanda Sangyutta. There, uh, instead of the six sense pieces, uh, the Buddha says, uh, when you develop concentration, things become manifest. And what is it that becomes manifest? Uh, it's the five aggregates. Uh, you see them as impermanent, as suffering, as not self. Uh, the next sutta, 35.161. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Rajagaha in Divaka's mango grove. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, make an exertion in seclusion. When a monk is secluded, things become manifest to him as they really are. And what becomes manifest to him as they really are is the same as uh, the previous sutta. You know, the I, or the forms, eye consciousness, eye contact, feeling that arises similarly for the other sense bases. Uh, all becomes very clear uh, as they really are. So here you see this pair of suttas uh, uh, we read before. It's also found in the Kanda Sangyutta. The Buddha stresses uh, on, con- on concentration and seclusion. As I mentioned before, seclusion, uh, there are two types of seclusion, uh, Kaya Viveka and Chitta Viveka. Kaya Viveka is body seclusion, that means being aloof from other people. And Chitta Viveka is mental seclusion, that means uh, going into the mind and becoming secluded from all thoughts and all mental workings. In other words, uh, you dwell in the mind and, and not in the world of the six senses. So. Two things are uh, always stressed by the Buddha, concentration and seclusion. The next sutta, 35.162. Then the Venerable Maha Kotita approached the Blessed One and said to him, Venerable Sir, it would be good if the Blessed One would teach me the Dhamma in brief, so that having heard the Dhamma from the Blessed One, I might dwell alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent and resolute. Stop here for a moment. Uh. This Maha Kotita is one of the uh, famous Arahants. Uh. So this Sutta, uh, since he has come to the Buddha for brief instructions uh, to practice, uh, must be before he was enlightened. Uh. And the Buddha said, Kotita, you should abandon desire for whatever is per- impermanent. And what is impermanent? The eye is impermanent. You should abandon desire for it. Forms are impermanent. We should abandon desire for them. I consciousness is impermanent. Similarly, the feeling that arises, uh, uh, contact and all that. uh, uh. So, similarly for the other um, sense bases, uh, um, the sense organ, the sense uh, object is impermanent, the sense consciousness, the sense contact and whatever feeling that arises, uh, all is impermanent. uh. 
So the Buddha says, uh, you should abandon desire for whatever is impermanent. But you think about it, uh, everything in the world is impermanent. So because everything in the world is impermanent, uh, everything in the world will give us suffering uh, if we cling to it. Uh, so understanding this, uh, we should uh, let go of craving for these things. And uh, not only that, we almost so must always remember uh, that very soon uh, we are going to die. Uh, uh, and if we don't practice well, we're going to take a rebirth uh, in a sorrowful place of rebirth. Uh, so it's the faster uh, we practice, the better for us. Uh. Okay, 35.228, 228, on page 1226. The Buddha said, Monks, the unlearned ordinary whirling speaks of the ocean, the ocean. But that is not the ocean in the noble one's discipline. That is only a great mass of water, a great expanse of water. The eye, monks, is the ocean for a person. Its current consists of forms. One who withstands that current consisting of forms is said to have crossed the ocean of the eye with its waves, whirlpools, sharks and demons. Crossed over, gone beyond, the Brahmin stands, the Brahmana stands on high ground. Similarly, the ear monks is the ocean for a person. Its current consists of sounds. One who withstands the current consisting of sounds is said to have crossed the ocean of the ear with its waves, whirlpools, sharks and demons. Crossed over, gone beyond, the Brahmana stands on high ground. Uh, similarly for all the other sense bases. Uh, this is what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the fortunate one, the teacher, further said, One who has crossed this ocean so hard to cross, with his dangers of sharks, demons and waves, the knowledge master who has lived the holy life, reached the world's end, is called one gone beyond. That's the end of the sutta. So here the Buddha says, uh, to the ordinary person, uh, the ocean uh, is just the sea, uh, the great expanse of water. But to a learned noble disciple of the Buddha, the six sense objects uh, is the ocean. And the current consists uh, of the, 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 the six sense bases, uh, the six sense organs uh, is the ocean. The current consists of the six sense objects. Uh, the six sense objects uh, will will have uh, a lot of whirlpools and sharks and demons and waves and all these uh, storms and all that uh, that will come uh, impinging on the six sense organs uh, and if you are not careful uh, you'll be drowned by all these uh, by all these uh, sense objects uh, and, and kill us also. so uh, if you know how to go across this ocean then uh, the brahmana stands on high ground the brahmana is a holy man so the Buddha is telling us uh, that uh, our six senses, uh, we have to be very careful. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, demons, uh, waves and sharks and whirlpools all uh, attacking us uh, at the six sense basis uh, through the six sense objects, uh, forms. Uh, all kinds of forms will come in, in the before your eye. Uh, all kinds of sounds will come to you. Uh, uh, all kinds of smells, taste, touch and thoughts. Uh, so depending, so it depends on you uh, how you're going to react. Uh. If you don't know how to react skillfully, uh, uh, you'll get into big problem. Uh. So the Buddha is telling us uh, that if we understand the Dhamma, then whatever these waves and demons and sharks and all that come, uh, we just don't react. Uh. Uh, you know how to keep our mind equanimous. Uh. Uh, you don't have craving as, as well as we don't have repulsion, uh, aversion. Uh. If we don't know how to steady our mind, uh, as the earlier sutta we read, uh, when you see pleasant objects, uh, you crave for pleasant objects. When you see ugly objects, uh, you are repelled by ugly objects. Similarly with sounds, uh, you hear nice sounds praising you, uh, uh, you become so happy. When you see, when you hear sounds which, uh, criticizing you, uh, you get so upset. Uh. So similarly for smell, taste, touch and thoughts. So the Buddha says uh, if we 
uh, have a bit of kung fu, uh, then uh, whatever comes uh, to attack us, uh, then we just uh, brush it off, uh, just uh, don't react. You know. The next sutta is 35.230. Monks, suppose a fisherman would cast a baited hook into a deep lake and a fish on the lookout for food would swallow it. That fish who, who has just, who has thus swallowed the fisherman's hook would meet with calamity and disaster and the fisherman could do with it as he wishes. So too, monks, there are these six hooks in the world for the calamity of beings, for the slaughter of living beings. There are monks, forms cognizable by the eye that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tantalizing. If a monk seeks delight in them, welcomes them, and remains holding to them, he is called a monk who has swallowed Mara's hook. He has met with calamity and disaster, and the evil one can do with him as he wishes. There are monks, sounds cognizable by the ear, smells cognizable by the nose, eh? Uh, taste cognizable by the tongue, touch cognizable by the body, and thoughts cognizable by the mind. Uh, that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tantalizing. If a monk seeks delight in them, welcomes them, and remains holding to them, he is called a monk who has swallowed Mara's hook. He has met with calamity and disaster, and the evil one can do with him as he wishes. There are monks, Forms cognizable by the eye that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tantalizing. If a monk does not seek delight in them, does not welcome them, does not remain holding to them, he is called a monk who has not swallowed Mara's hook, who has broken the hook, demolished the hook. He has not met with calamity and disaster, and the evil one cannot do with him as he wishes. There are monks, sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, taste cognizable by the tongue, touch cognizable by the body, thoughts cognizable by the mind. If a monk does not seek delight in them, does not welcome them, does not remain holding to them, he is called a monk who has not swallowed Mara's hook, has broken the hook, demolished the hook. He has not met with calamity, and the evil one cannot do with him as he wishes. That's the end of the sutta. So here, uh, just like the fisherman wanting to catch the fish, uh, he puts a hook uh, with a bait on it, uh, like a worm or something, uh, into the water. And the hungry uh, fish uh, will come and swallow the bait uh, and get hooked. Uh. Uh, then uh, he's at the mercy of the fisherman. So similarly, Mara has put out six hooks for us. Uh, these uh, six hooks uh, with the bait. Uh, what is the bait? Forms, uh, beautiful forms for us to see. Uh, beautiful sounds to entice us. Uh, uh, beautiful smells and lovely taste and touch and thoughts. Uh, uh, so if we are not careful, uh, then uh, we are going to enjoy uh, these uh, worldly pleasures. Uh, then we are caught by Mara's hook. Uh, we become a slave. Uh, to them, then uh, we cannot get free of the hook. Uh, we become a slave of uh, Mara. Uh, and there are some people uh, who are hooked very badly, uh, like drug addicts, drunks, and all that. Uh. So all these suttas are giving us warning uh, that the world uh, is not so uh, pleasurable as you think. Uh. Are not so enjoyable. You can enjoy first and then you pay for them with tears later. <laughs> I think I'll stop here for the moment. I think to discuss. We are coming towards the end of the chapter and the suttas. And the suttas are very interesting. Uh, Kill you lah, because uh, if you are hooked uh, by the six hooks, uh, you'll be whirled around the samsara, the 
round of rebirths, huh? you'll be slaughtered many times, huh? you have to die many times huh? in the round of samsara. Cycle of birth and death. You know, when we go to school, huh? we go to kindergarten, then we go to elementary school or primary school, then we go to secondary school, then we go to college or university, then after that we go to a postgraduate or some people. So for people whose influences are very strong and they are like students in the kindergarten or primary school. They have a long way to go. That means they have to do a lot of work. So there's no shortcut. No shortcut in life. There are some people you can see that they are just not spiritually mature. So there are some people when you try to encourage them to come and listen to the Dhamma, they will refuse to listen. You try to teach them to abstain from certain unwholesome practices, uh, they refuse to abstain. They have just not come to that stage, uh, that level. Uh. So they will have to suffer more. Uh, when they suffer, uh, then they will learn. This, uh, if we don't discipline ourselves, uh, the world will discipline us. Mm. So we have to learn the hard way, you know. Just like this now, uh, we read the Sutta, you have unwholesome states of mind within you. Uh, that was going to be your teacher, uh, make you suffer until you wake up. Uh. The easy way uh, is to do chanting. Uh. Chanting is a, is a long tradition uh, in all religions, uh. not only Buddhism. Uh. In Buddhism, we do chanting like the Buddha. The, f- the first meditation the Buddha taught uh, was actually chanting on the 32 parts of the body. Uh. And um, we can also chant like the Parita, we can chant like Buddha, Buddha, or we can chant Arahang, Arahang, or we can chant Namo Tassa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Sama Sambuddhasa, or we can chant Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya. So like in Hinduism, uh, they have a lot of mantras for you to chant. And even in Islam also they chant. Uh, even in Christianity also they chant. So it's a very universally recognized uh, method uh, to calm the mind. Uh, and that is the easiest uh, way. Uh. In fact, this chanting is very powerful. If you try not to sleep at night, uh, you try to chant, keep chanting, chanting, try to maintain your wakefulness. Uh. Mm. So this, that is one way. And then um, we have to use our own wisdom, la, depending on that person. La. He has to see his own problem, la. what is his problem and how to deal with it. La. Uh, so sometimes uh, we have to fight la, our weaknesses, uh, have to meet it head on. La. You don't have the courage to meet it head on, la. you don't have the strength to fight it, la. then you will forever be a slave of your weakness. La. When I was young, I was frightened by adults, made to be frightened of dark places. And especially when I went my parents to see Pontiana show. And after that, a ghost show. After that, I remember for one continuous week, every night I had nightmares. So after that, I'd be afraid of dark places. But after I became a monk, then I went to Thailand in 1986. After one year in Thailand, I came back to Malaysia. And because I had seen forest monasteries in Thailand, then I also had this inspiration to look for a quiet, secluded place to practice on my own. So I went to Ipoh and looked for caves. I went to many caves and I found that all the beautiful caves were taken up by people. So some devotees, devotees started to look for a cave for me and they found one suitable cave behind Simpang Polai. But it was a very dark cave, totally dark, very dark. So 
when I first went into that cave, uh, I dare not stay inside also. I had to stay the entrance there, uh, actually the back entrance. Uh, stayed in a higher place, uh, outside where it was bright. Uh, I stayed two nights there. And then uh, I realized that it's not so comfortable. And one, there are two reasons why I like to stay in cave. Uh, one is it's very cool inside. Uh, in a hot afternoon or so, you feel cool inside. Secondly, yeah, it cuts out all the sound outside. Mm, you can't hear the traffic, you can't hear uh, noise from houses and all that. And normally, of course, caves are away from houses also. Lah. Yeah. So, uh, the first two nights I stayed at the uh, rear entrance, uh, at the elevated place. Uh, then I realized that it was not so comfortable because in the afternoons, uh, it'd be warm. Lah. The warm air will come will come, so it's not conducive for meditation. And then the second night I stayed there, I had a dream. I had a dream that some devas uh, asked, asked me to come, and they wanted to see who was this fellow sleeping there. And then uh, I went to their presence, and I saw these about five devas, uh, and one of them was seated, the others were standing, and they all looked very, very, very nicely, and uh, very nicely dressed. Uh, they were like Indian, uh, Indian devas. Uh, the leader was seated. So when I went to their presence, uh, they looked at me, and I looked at them. And after that, when I looked at myself, uh, I, sound, I found that I was exactly like them, like a deva. I was dressed up like a deva. Then I woke up. Then I realized uh, they were trying to tell me, uh, they, they accept me as a member, that if I stay inside the cave, uh, there will be no problem. Uh, then after that, I moved into that cave. I moved in that cave, and then I stayed there for four months. Uh, so after four months, I got used to dark, dark places. I huh? got no more fear of dark places. <laughs> so that's the only way huh? to fight your fear. Huh? So similarly, huh? to fight our weaknesses, huh? sometimes huh? we have to bash it head on. Huh? If you cannot, then you have to use your wisdom and huh? see how to deal with it huh? stage by stage. You know? If a person is uh, kind of possessed, uh, then uh, he needs to do a lot of uh, meritorious deeds la, to bring up the karma. La, that's one thing. Bring up the, 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 the what we say, Kwan So Ko, Ji Un Kwan. That's one thing. And then uh, the place where that person stays is also important. La. You stay in a place like a monastery actually is very good because uh, then the vibrations are good here. So it's not conducive for an uh, evil spirit uh, to stay in such a place. Uh. Then uh, when a person does uh, uh, meritorious deeds uh, like helping in a monastery and all that, uh, he or she uh, becomes happy uh, you know, when you help others. Uh, and that's the that's a result uh, of uh, skillful action, uh, wholesome action, action that uh, benefits others. Uh. Uh, you become happy yourself, uh, and you become happy, uh, then your state of mind slowly changes. Uh. Uh, a lot of people, uh, because of not doing enough good karma, they tend to become depressed. Uh. I know of some people, uh, they like. One person I know uh, was not filial enough to the parents, uh, so when the parents died, uh, he got into depression. Probably he doesn't understand or so. Uh, but you can see uh, most likely uh, due to that uh, not doing enough for parents, uh, so after parents have passed away, uh, you will naturally regret. So such people, uh, they have to do more good deeds. Uh, charity and all that, uh, then uh, they become happier persons. After they become more happy, uh, then the mind is quietened down. When the mind quietens down, uh, then they can see things more clearly. Uh. If you are not happy, uh, then the mind is very easily agitated. Uh. Small things will make you agitated. Uh. Mm. So that's why wholesome karma is very important, very good for us. Uh. You see a lot of people uh, who are miserable uh, because they only think of themselves. Uh. Uh, a lot of people uh, only think of their own problem. The more they think of their problem, uh, the more the worse they become. On the other hand, uh, there are some people who are smarter. If they have free time, they go and help others. 
uh, like a lot of uh, Westerners, uh, you see, uh, they like to devote their free time uh, to do charitable work, to do social work and all that. Uh, and by helping others, uh, you get a lot of happiness. Uh. I have some sisters uh, who are, have migrated to Australia. Now they are old. Uh, they also join these charitable, charitable organizations. Whenever people are sick and need help, uh, sometimes need just uh, somebody to talk to. Uh, some, you know, a lot of old people, uh, they're very lonely, uh, especially in the West. Uh, they need somebody to talk to them. Uh. So my sisters go and sometimes talk to them, keep them company. And, and the old person becomes very happy, you know, you got a friend to talk to. And that, that makes the, the, the person, uh, like my sister, uh, also very happy uh, because you know uh, you help people. Uh. So helping others uh, is very, very important. You think you help others, actually you're helping yourself. <laughs> Just like a uh, dana, you know. Uh, sometimes uh, like monks go begging for food. Sometimes monks, uh, some, some people can see like the monastery is quite well supported. Uh. You even you don't go and the monk doesn't go and beg for food or so, uh, he will still get enough food to eat. But the monk, the Buddha uh, taught monks uh, to purposely go on arms round uh, to give people the opportunity to do dana, uh, to give the opportunity for people to, to, to get blessings. Uh. That's why in the Vinaya books uh, it is not allowed for a monk uh, to stay alone in the deep forest. Uh, and feed himself on roots, uh, on fruits that have fallen from the forest, uh, on leaves and all that. Not allowed. No. A monk uh, must go and beg for his food uh, or accept offerings in the monastery. Uh. Uh, so sometimes, you know, like uh, we, we, a monk does this, uh, it's for the good of the, of the people. Sometimes if people don't realize uh, they think that the monk actually really needs the food or what. Uh, sometimes it's not. Yeah, but uh, in the monastery, yeah, I think the whole monastery is good vibration. <laughs> Cosna uh, is good uh, to uh, to sit in a group uh, when you have group sitting. Uh, the energy uh, is very good. But if some people find it uh, uh, too difficult, uh, then they allow. Uh, except that uh, for monastics, uh, we are more strict. Uh, uh, once you wear the robe, uh, you have uh, signed a contract uh, to, uh, to to practice the, the holy life as well as you can, uh, at least for the du duration that you are staying here. Mm. So that's why uh, for monastics, uh, people who wear the robe, uh, I want all of them to sit here. Uh, but of course, if they want to do walking meditation, they can walk anywhere. Uh, but when it comes to sitting, uh, they should sit together here. Okay, come and transfer that in. Huh?